Uh, Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Chicago. I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce stuff. My name is Emilazer. Oh, let's get to it. The area of today's Chicago is inhabited by the Algonquian people of Miami and Muscotan tribes. The name Chicago came from the French explorer's interpretation of a Miami, Illinois word Chicaqua or Chicaqua, meaning wild garlic, which according to the French explorers grew in an abundance on the south end of Lake Michigan. The Chicago Portage, which forms a water connection from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River system, attracted the attention of many French traders who brought the beaver trade to the Chicago area, effectively making it a strategically important area of the 17th century beaver wars. After the beaver wars, most of the Algonquin tribes were driven out of the area by the Iroquois, which in turn left the area after the non fun Treaty in the 1920s. During this time, other tribes like Ojibwes and Potawatomis tried to settle the area, but there are no signs of any permanent settlements by them. The French also tried to colonize the area, but eventually they were driven out by the Native American raids during the Fox Wars. The first old world settler in Chicago was Jean-Baptiste Poindu-Sabre, who built a farm at the mouth of the Chicago River by the year 1788. In 1795, after the Northwest Indian War, USA finally gained more authority over the area and to assert its claim built the Fort Dearborn on the Chicago River. Sadly, the fort was destroyed in the War of 1812 and many of the inhabitants were killed or taken prisoner by the Native American tribes. However, after the war, the Fort Dearborn was rebuilt in 1818 to again assert the US claim over the area and deter any raids by the Native Americans. In the year 1829, the area of today's Chicago had fewer than 100 inhabitants, most of which were soldiers serving in the Fort Dearborn, but interestingly enough, there was a one legal tavern in the area at the time owned by Archibald Caldwell, who was most certainly the first landlord with a tavern in Chicago. A year later, 4th of August, 1830, the Platte of Chicago was charted, and this is seen as the first official recognition of an area called Chicago. After its official recognition, many New England entrepreneurs started to pour money into the area's development as they saw the potential of Chicago becoming a transportation hub. Three years later, a town of Chicago was founded with a population of around 350 people and in the next seven years, the number will increase by whole 12 folds during which Chicago is granted city status by the state of Illinois. Even though Chicago's population has started to increase, much of its wealth still came from farming. It wasn't until the 1848 opening of the Illinois Michigan Canal which allowed shipping from the Great Lakes through Chicago to the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico that Chicago started to grow as a trading hub. Later this was reinforced by the 1850s construction of railroads which helped solidify Chicago's claim as one of the most important trading hubs in the USA. Over 30 railway lines entered the city with the main lines from east ending in Chicago and the main lines heading west beginning in Chicago. By the 1860s the city became the nation's transshipment hub and warehousing center. With so many materials flowing through the city it made makes only sense that a large number of factories sprang up during the 1850s and 60s. With this sudden industrialization, the city also underwent a huge expansion in population, going from a little above 4,000 people in 1840 to 30,000 people in 1850 and 122,000 people in 1860. However, this sudden spike in population and industrialization combined with the fact that Chicago was almost the same elevation as Lake Michigan created a little or no naturally occurring drainage. Because of this, many travelers to Chicago reported it as the filthiest city in America. Plus, the standing water harbored pathogens and caused numerous epidemics. This forced the city to take the drainage problem seriously and started a huge project of putting down sewer pipes and then lifting parts of the city over them. In one instance, an entire acre of masonry rows of shops and offices were lifted 4 feet 8 inches over the course of 5 days. During this time, all of the businesses were still open, people came, went, shopped and worked in them as if it was an ordinary day. This tremendous undertaking of putting down the sewer system and lifting of the city helped drastically with the outbreak of epidemics and the city could once again function to its full capacity. Going into the 1870s, things seemed great. The city was booming with large factories being built to refine the huge portions of goods flowing through the city's trading hubs. Working in the vastly growing sector were large numbers of German and Irish immigrants looking for a better future. Unfortunately, in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire struck. No one knows how the fire started, but when it did, 
it spread like wildfire, consuming much of central Chicago, burning for three days straight. When it was finally contained, one-third of the city's 300,000 inhabitants were homeless and 300 of them were dead. Now with much of the city center in ruins, Chicago decided to pivot, replacing the former wooden structures with brick and masonry. At first, building these structures was a problem as the soft, swampy ground near the lake proved unstable for tall masonry buildings. But the builders developed a new innovation of still framing the supports of a building, effectively creating the basis for the modern skyscraper. In fact, it was in Chicago that the first modern definition of a skyscraper was built in 1884. Sadly, the building was demolished in 1931, but similar buildings from that time period still stand in Chicago today. Now rebuilt from the Great Fire and going into the 20th century, Chicago got another major influx of immigrants, this time mostly Jewish and Western Slavic people, and also sizable numbers of Greek and Italians, putting the city's population well over 2 million people before World War I. After World War I, however, the migration slowed down and almost stopped, as new government immigration laws were passed making it harder for Eastern Europeans to come into the country. During the Prohibition era, the city became a playing ground for mobsters that gained money and influence through the control of the city's illegal alcohol trade. However, the Roaring Twenties wouldn't last, and with the hit of the Great Depression, Chicago, just as any other city in USA, struggled to keep afloat. Nonetheless, thanks to the post-World War II economy boom, Chicago was back on track, expanding its trading hubs and industry. But with the lack of cheap labor from Europe due to immigration laws, Chicago gained a large influx of African American workers from the South, which in 1990s made up almost 40% of the city's population. Chicago today is part of the Rust Belt, with its industry shifting from unskilled physical labor to more skilled finance, marketing, computer, adecta based labor. This creates lots of new skilled jobs in the city, but also excludes the large population of unskilled workers, which are forced to leave the city to find jobs elsewhere. However, unlike other Rust Belt cities, Chicago has managed to make this transition quite successfully, even being named by GQ as the city of the year in 2008. Chicago as a city is a great example of the American historical city building scene. The fact that a city can be founded in the same century that its population reaches a million is astounding. It shows us the economically strategical importance of the Chicago area and the willingness of millions of migrants to leave their homes for a better life in the Windy City.